I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, yeah, born and raised there and moved away when I was 18. I grew up um, listening to music from my dad's record collection and from my sister's record collection. My dad had um, was a drummer, a jazz drummer in the 60s, so he had a lot of music like John Coltrane and Keith Jarrett and Charles Lloyd and you know Pat Metheny. Um, and then a, lot, a fair amount of um, 60s folk music like Bob Dylan and Neil Young and Crosby, Stills and Nash and The Grateful Dead um, and some classical music um, at home, you know, kind of Tchaikovsky and Vivaldi and sort of, you know, like very famous uh, old works. Um, and my sister was uh, a dancer, um, <clears throat> danced in the Cincinnati Ballet and was then became a modern dancer. And so she had a lot more sort of avant-garde music um that I heard growing up, and then a lot of punk rock. So in uh, southwestern Ohio, it was sort of a hotbed in the, you know, late 80s, early 90s to um, a bunch of interesting bands like the Breeders or Afghan Wigs or, you know, a lot of lesser known bands. So that, so it was kind of, you know, I had a lot of music in the house when I was a kid. Well, I also grew up playing the flute um, until I was a teenager. So I started when I was, you know, playing recorder and then fife and then piccolo and then flute. Um, really, you know, um, we used to joke in high school because all the kids would have band class and I always get an hour off because I was like a little flute virtuoso so I couldn't play with the other kids. <laughs> so they would send me to do my own thing, um, which ended up being a good deal for me. Um, I probably didn't practice enough, though. Um, so yeah, I played flute and then in my teenage years, I switched to guitar, I taught myself electric guitar for about a year. And then probably around age 14 or 15, I started playing classical guitar and enrolled at the, um, college conservative music, uh, at UC and got really into kind of fell in love with Bach and Spanish music. And, you know, I had been reading music by playing the flute, but then transferred it to the guitar and, and that's kind of how I then started developing. Yeah, right when I started playing guitar, my brother and I started bands, and we we never learned other people's songs. We just I don't know why we did that. Uh, maybe because they were too hard to figure out or something. But we just decided we would make up our own songs. Um, you know, we learned a few. You know, we used to jam on some stuff um, that we figured out, but. Um, we just started playing music we would write, um, and we had bands, and and that kept developing, and then I was studying classical music, and then I went to Yale, and there was a great composition department, and I got to take classes with them, and, and then did a master's degree, and, you know, was around people like David Lang, and Martin Bresnik, and Ingram Marshall, who sadly just passed away, and, you know, a lot of really interesting composers, and, um, and then I started writing more experimental or more instrumental music. Um, I had a, yeah, so that's kind of, it developed in my 20s. And then, um, you know, from there, I just was asked to start writing for different combinations of instruments and orchestras and stuff. You know, I never thought I would be a professional artist, um, but I was driven to creativity as a, as a means of expression, you know, um, we grew up in a part of the world, well, you know, in Southern Ohio where, um, you know, in the eighties kids were getting into trouble and, um, you know, we saw people kind of falling, literally falling or, you know, things, bad things happening around us. And um, I'm speaking about me and my brother and, you know, my sister was a dancer and we saw that she had a creative output creative outlet and um, how important that was. You know, my parents are not artists. My dad played the drums, but it was, you know, they're not professional artists. And so we never really, I didn't know anyone who did that um, until I went to college. And so I think for me, it was more just a kind of necessity of, um, I was really, I loved art and literature and I had some good teachers in high school who exposed me to really interesting books and you know and just the idea but I remember you know that the, we went to a little school and had basically almost no music department so we kind of became the music department and I, I learned to play Irish music with the um the biology biology teacher was a good fiddler so you know she would teach me Irish music and the English teacher was like this blues 60s uh 
pianist. Um, and so he taught us rock and roll and we kind of figured it out that way. Um, and then later the bug, you know, just kind of kept getting deeper and just basically it just kind of fell into it. But, it, you know, I never dreamed that I would be able to really like support a family doing it. Um, but so that's the love, kind of lucky um, and hard work, I guess, that paid off. I mean, I think that collaboration is the key word um, in when talking about my career because I'm always interacting with other people, you know, whether that be writing for Kronos, um, you know, working with my band, maybe arranging songs for, for a pop singer or working with a soloist in an orchestra. There's a community around me and there always has been basically since quite early on and I was lucky to meet like-minded musicians um, in high school and college and music school and then in my early professional years, including kind of, you know, important composers who people like Steve Reich or Philip Glass or Terry Riley, who I was interest, introduced to through Kronos, through David Harrington, um, where I really learned that um, you don't make music in isolation. I think we have a kind of a very uh, archaic and outdated idea of a composer as being this sort of isolated genius who lives in a cabin somewhere on the coast of California. There's actually a very famous composer who maybe lives up there in a cabin on the coast of California. But um, I think that, that, you know, for most of us, that's not the case. And, you know, actually music is made in community and, you know, the great music traditions are collective, you know, if you think about, you know, singing in a choir or, um, you know, um, all kinds of music is it's it's a great collaborative art and so that um that's the theme that runs through my life basically and and i've been surrounded by really talented people who've enabled me to kind of follow my instincts and my interests and not feel pigeonholed you know when you're in school you're often taught to do one thing or you won't succeed and actually the the opposite has been true for me um where i you know maybe i don't do any one thing as good as some other people but i have a kind of a, a really wide range of interests. I tend to be the same musician, what I'm, whatever I'm doing. And in a way, when I'm composing music like a string quartet, that's the purest version of me you're going to get. Um, where if I'm working in a really collaborative band or something, it's much more, it's like a quilt of just pattern work coming from, you know, 15 different people, really. And that that's fascinating. And when it's done well, it's kind of greater than the sum of its parts. Um but um, but yeah, I thrive on having different experiences, and I think I would recommend it to any young person. I think the first time I heard a string quartet was probably in high school, seeing you know student concerts at CCM at the, at the College Conservative of Music, and I think probably like a Haydn string quartet or maybe Beethoven, and I remember thinking like, wow, it sounds like an orchestra, um, you know that something about a string quartet it's like you just don't need anything else um you know string trios occasionally feel that way too but you know they, there's so much you can do um with a string quartet and um you know i think actually chronos's recording of different trains is probably one of the first recordings that i was quite passionate about um you know in my teenage years where i heard that and that was very I didn't know what it was, you know, I didn't know, was that a string quartet? I mean, it was, it was so different from anything I knew, uh, but I was quite excited about it. I have a very beautiful story with Kronos, really, where I think for my development as a composer, they were incredibly um, influential, both in my education growing up as a musician and listening to them, because really they they have such an important place in American music and, you know, especially in kind of defining a really broad idea of what can fit in a concert hall um, in a very, very open arms um, non-hierarchical, you know, which is a lot of things people are talking about finally now in institutions Kronos has been doing for 40, 50 years. I kind of grew up in a world they made. Um, you know, I would say, I would say people like Meredith Monk, Laurie Anderson, um, you know, 
uh, Steve Reich, Philip Glass. I, th- I would say they also were part of it. But I think that you know, as in, as interpreters, in a way, Kronos is a special place because there there's never any one agenda. It's a really so they you know they basically invited me um, at the time I was interpreting. I was playing a lot of chamber music and writing my own music in my own groups. But I was, it was one, you know one of the first commissions I'd had was to write a Haim, which is, you know, one of my early pieces and probably the piece Kronos has played the most of mine. While often instrumental music, classical music, contemporary classical music, whatever you want to call it, um, um, it can be sort of loosely considered savant or intellectual or academic. And actually the thing that I've learned from Kronos is something about physical music that there's a physicality to sound, um, and I think that that's what attracted Kronos to my work, you know, especially in that piece of Haim, there's very little going on. It's almost just five notes or just one chord, really, but it's extremely physical. Um, and I think all of my pieces since, um, you know, I've veered in and out of many different things, but I think that that physicality is something that is maybe, um, you know, sometimes not always primary in certain you know, for certain, certain music, but for me, it's really important. You know, as a guitar player, strings do all kinds of things that, um, guitars can't do. And so I'm really drawn to that, you know, the, the high ethereal, whether it be high harmonics or just, just a single, you know, a violin can kind of go into the stratosphere just playing two notes. And it's just the most gorgeous thing you've ever heard. Um, all kinds of techniques, like whether it be, you know, Bartok pits or, you know, playing Sulpon, where, you know, bow placement, just hearing, you know, Hank, like, move his bow on the, you know, on the instrument and hear how the overtones, you know, it's playing a, you're playing a, like a low C, but just moving the bow changes the overtones and you hear all kinds of other pitches. And so that, you know, I think in all of my pieces I've written for them, I'm exploring things like that. Um, I love kind of setting up something for them, you know, for a group a string quartet to play, but then leaving enough freedom in in it, um, in the score, that there's room for them to kind of um, improvise or find textures and kind of, you know, because inevitably musicians find solutions that you would never have thought of, and that's when you're working with such talented musicians, that's, you know, part of the joy of it. Um, you know, I love to hear strings play fast because they can sometimes, you know, you, like it's just exhilarating when they really dig in, um, to something is, is quite exhilarating. Um, you know, obviously strings have become really associated with kind of filmic cinematic music, but there's a reason for that because it's like, it, it's so quick to emotion. Um, and I use, you know, I do arrange a lot of music in my band or I orchestrate music for other singers and things. And obviously strings, I like to do things in songs that you would never normally hear, you know, where you're, you're trying textures that would never normally be there. And it's kind of, it's like you're hearing a familiar thing, but in a different way. I mean, I had long been interested in historical music. A lot of my pieces is a piece called Lacrimae, which is um, a string orchestra piece um, that references a song by John Dowland, uh, who is a Elizabethan, you know, 16th century English composer. And that there, there's examples of that everywhere, including in Tenebrae, which is one of the big string quartets I wrote for Kronos, um, references a lot of Renaissance vocal music um, written for the Holy Week. Um, so I'd done it before, um, but, you know, I kind of, for this piece, I, I went earlier into 12th century polyphony, um, Perrotin, so the Cederan Principe is, is a, a just a gorgeous piece. I mean, you know, Steve Reich is also very influenced by that music, um, and it's, I'd never done anything with it, and, you know, this piece, I was, David asked me to write it, and um, it was around the time that Notre Dame in Paris uh, had burned. And um, and so I was kind of thinking about there was this, this le bois is like the the vaulted ceiling where there was you know like a thousand year old oak up there that had been there all those years and then just burned in an instant and um, and so I started thinking about the you know just the fragility of life and the impermanence of everything and then also just that wood as a as a as a physical presence in all the music that you know Notre Dame is 
like a great musical center uh, of humanity in a way. And, you know, the, the very instrumental and kind of the early notated music um, in the way that we started, um, you know, as they started to kind of define notation and these things. And um, so Paratown was a composer there in the early days of the cathedral. And so I've kind of imagined this music resonating in this place. And so I, the piece that I wrote called Le Bois, it, um, it references, um, there's little, you know, motives or quotes actually from the Paratown that then kind of develop and spin into other textures and more modern sounds. For me, often I have a non-musical inspiration in my head. It doesn't always make it on the page or even in the program note. But for me, it's I'm just really um, inspired by other artists, by the natural world around me, by personal experiences, by friendships, by teachers, by you know. So I, I often reflect that in the music I'm making, and I think that that is a is a well. Um, a creative well that can be a resource for young musicians, you know, and that, you know, the, the people that you meet and the, the projects that you make will, will nourish you, um, in terms of your own creative output. So that's one thing I would say. Um, and then I think also there's something about writing a string quartet, which is the kind of poetry of the form where you're, you know, you're dealing with a historical, archetype which is so um well documented and powerful and you know kind of canonized where there's these giant works of you know you say every you sit down and write a string quartet it's a little bit like sitting down to write a violin concerto or a what well, you know it's 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 a he, it's a weighty thing no matter how you approach it um but i think it's an evergreen form um something about it just let maybe let kind of like a rock band you know like it's just something about it if you just allow yourself to embrace it and make some sounds it'll be you you know and i think that that the individuality that'll shine through um is really important and that we want to hear what young people are you know thinking about and making and, and writing and and that they should do it you know the string quartet is a, a wonderful place to do that Like Kronos, I've been inspired by seeing, you know, artists who are involved in curating their own festivals or, you know, empowering other artists and, you know, running their own label or, and so those are things that I've always been supportive of and tried to, tried to do as much of as I can. Um, there's a small music festival in Cincinnati, Ohio called Music Now that I started in 2005. Um, we haven't done it in a few years because of COVID, but um, it you know ran for 15, 16 years and was a really important part of my, my creative life. Um, there's a, a couple of record labels, one called Brassland and one called 37DO3D <clears throat> that I was involved in founding and that still both are active and put out a lot of music by young people. And I think that, you know, that um, I find it really, especially in an era where form and, you know, distribution of music, whether it be on the internet or the radio, or whatever is shifting so rapidly. Um, <clears throat> it's felt good to participate in that conversation. Make it your own. Um, there's no rules. Um, yeah, surprise me. For the the young artists listening to this interview, I would say that um, there's such a depth and wonder in the Kronos repertoire, um, both in this project, um, but also in their recorded work. That I would I would highly recommend taking a deep dive um, into those albums and all that amazing music, you know, starting with George Crumb's Black Angels and, you know, all the way through all the records they've made. I think that um, I do that all the time when I'm, you know, in a lurch for, a, for an idea. If you just, you know, go listen to them, I think that that, it, that can be quite, quite inspiring. <laughs>